question this week is, does the North have a capital? In the past, it certainly did, and there was no question about where it was. York. In the Middle Ages, York was the capital of the North. In fact, by the end of the 14th century, in the country as a whole, it had become second only to London in terms of wealth and size of population. And by the end of the Middle Ages, it was mega in terms of the church, political power and trade. It was capital of the North, in fact. Medieval York is everywhere. It's surrounded by an almost complete set of medieval walls, a more complete set than anywhere else in Britain, and inside them there are more surviving medieval buildings than in any other city in the country. I said that really boldly as if I knew that it was true, and yet I made it up, but I bet it is true. There is the Minster, of course. If only I could, uh, if only I could find it. You walk along these little narrow medieval streets and there's not a minster in sight. Has somebody pinched it? And then suddenly... You get biffed over the head by the scale and by the grandeur of it. You emerge out of the little streets and immediately you're right up against its walls and you're forced to gaze upwards at the sky. One of the most remarkable things about York is that a building as great and as ancient as this isn't really old in terms of the city. This is a Roman column, for example, a visible reminder that down there, underneath the pavement, is the whole Roman city of Ibaracum, the capital of the Roman North. It was the capital of the province of Britannia Inferior, which has always rather irritated me because London is the capital of Britannia Superior. I don't like being inferior. Mind you, York was also the capital of the North in Viking times, and the streets in the central area of York are really Viking streets. Now this is Stonegate. Gate doesn't mean a gate, if you follow my drift. Well, obviously it often does, but in this context it comes from the Viking word gata, which means a street. So here I am walking up the gata and I'm about to go into a snicket. Sounds like a bit of an insult. You horrible little Yorkshire snicket you. But which is in fact the Viking word for an alleyway or a lane. So walking around York is to follow routes far older even than medieval. It's to tread where all the little Olafs and Gudruns of Jorvik, the Viking capital of the north, have trod before you. Now, isn't that something? There are no visible Viking remains to be seen on these ancient streets, but they are lined with medieval houses, hundreds of them. Some of them shout their presence at you with their dramatic black timbers set against the whitewashed walls between. Others have been sneakily disguised by later centuries, their timbers plastered over. But in a street like this, virtually every building is medieval inside and out. That's what makes it so exciting. It's not just skin deep. There are buildings all over York with complete medieval interiors. This is Gudrum Gate, for example, which contains at least two fantastic medieval interiors. Probably loads more but two that I've been lucky enough to get inside. Number 51, for example. 51 Goodroom Gate is a bit of a goodie. It's beautifully preserved outside, but inside it still contains its original hall. In a medieval house, the hall was the main room of the house, the main living room for the family and the servants. And there are plenty of great halls preserved in medieval mansions, but it's very rare to find them surviving in houses of this size, and especially in the middle of town. I mean, really rare. Usually later owners have put a ceiling in to give themselves a bit of extra room upstairs. So this, with its dramatic timber framing, is a really precious survival. Even more precious is the interior of Holy Trinity Church, which is behind these houses. 14th century houses, 700 years old. The church is hidden in behind here in what can only be described as a sneaky manner. <laughs> 
Apart from the Minster, there are 14 other surviving medieval parish churches in York, but this one's my favourite. It's never really been restored. It still has no electricity and it's a jumble of wonderful old furniture and uneven floors and worn stonework. And it has some superb 15th century stained glass. Here's St George, for example, looking absolutely spiffing in a very glamorous suit of armour. I bet he never got that out of the catalogue. And there are loads of virgins too, including St Ursula and her 11,000 virgin followers, which is probably some sort of record, even for York. Over the years, I've filmed in so many beautiful buildings in York that it would be churlish of me not to show you a few of them. And I'm not a churl, though I probably would have been in medieval times. So, lots of lovely spots. But for me, the real glories of medieval York are the narrow streets, lined, if I could put it in technical language, with sticky-outy bits. There they are, sticky-outy bits. They're really called jetties. Houses had jetties to give themselves a bit more room. On the ground floor, you were restricted as to how far you could stick out into the street, but higher up, you could snaffle a bit of extra space. But the main reason they built jetties in the Middle Ages, I'm sure, is because they look good, top-heavy, impressive. They were just dirty show-offs, but they have created some of the most picturesque and best-loved streets in the country. To see them on a winter's afternoon, when the shop windows are bright in the gloom at street level and the gables stand out against the darkening skies, oh, it's enough to make you turn medieval and start saying, Odds bodikins, my liege. Actually, it makes me want to go Christmas shopping, and it's not often that you hear a man say that. Especially a Geordie man. Actually, I'm not a Geordie. I come from Carlisle, but I do live here, so I'm a sort of pretendy Geordie. And I've come back home in order to explore the second of the towns that made a bid to become the capital of the North. In the Middle Ages, when York was the second most important town in the country, Newcastle-upon-Tyne was a measly ninth. It was still a very impressive measly ninth, mind you. Its defensive walls were among the most powerful in the kingdom, and there was a mighty castle which was far from measly, and a clutch of fine churches and all of the medieval trimmings. It was a tightly packed medieval town. Like York, it had lots of little snickets. Except that here, they're not called snickets, they're called chairs. This is where Newcastle started, down by the riverside, and on the steep banks to the north of it. Which is a wonderful place and remains to this day the image that most people have of Tyneside. But if Newcastle was ever going to grow, it had to escape from here. Expansion could only happen at the top of the hill. And that was the problem. There was only one bridge over the Tyne, and only one route into town. It's still a problem for this fat little presenter because even unto this day it is an exceedingly steep route and goes on for a very long time. But in those days it was narrow and difficult as well as steep. But despite the difficulties, Newcastle was getting wealthier and was all set to try and overtake York. And by 1700 it had done a sneaky overtaking manoeuvre and had leapt into the lead. In 1698, somebody wrote, it most resembles London of any place in England. Its buildings, lofty and large, of brick mostly or stone, the streets broad and handsome. 
Ere long, the streeties were destined to become even more broad and handsome, because at the very end of the Georgian period, Newcastle was one of those cities that made a quite deliberate bid to become a regional capital. About 30 years ago, maybe a little bit more, there was a famous tug-of-love case involving a Newcastle lady and her French husband. And I can remember Paris Match, the French magazine Paris Match, did a feature on the case during which it described Newcastle as an old mining town, still locked in the horrors of the Industrial Revolution. Well, it was wrong, that French magazine. It was wrong then, and it's wrong now. Newcastle, as you can see, is filled with street after street of beautiful and gracious architecture. In fact, it's the only city in England which has got a planned centre. It was a plan devised by a property developer called Richard Granger. They don't have a very good reputation these days, property developers, and this one had a plan which involved demolishing a market and a newly built theatre. It meant pulling down whole streets and knocking down loads of houses. There was even a huge historic mansion called Anderson Place. That had to go. Half the city was knocked down. He would never have got away with it nowadays, of course. Nowadays we'd have ended up with about 13 different planning inquiries and conservationists like me would have jumped up and down in an excited manner and we'd have ended up with some ghastly watered down version of the plan in a nice sensible style in order to fit in with what was already there. What actually happened was that he presented the plan to the City Council in June 1834 and they accepted it there and then, and the work started straight away. Less than a year later, the biggest building in the plan, the massive new indoor market, now called Granger Market, was up and running. And by 1840, the City of Newcastle had a new plan centre of grand, spacious, sophisticated, classical streets, completely different in scale and style to anything that was there before. And we've loved it ever since, but of course it never did make us capital of the North, because by 1840 there were new contenders, twice as big. I'm talking about Manchester and Liverpool, which by the middle of the 19th century had become the new super cities bigger and richer than most of the capital cities of Europe. Because they dealt in cotton, and therefore with America, they'd become global cities. And it shows in their architecture. We'll come to Manchester in a moment or two, but first of all, Liverpool, which has got the stuff that most people recognise. Its docks are the greatest docks in the world, and the whole commercial centre of the city is chock-a-block with terrific Victorian buildings. There are huge, confident insurance offices and banks, all in stone, all richly carved. The palaces of a capitalist culture. And there are also civic buildings, a remarkable collection of public buildings, most of them splendidly neoclassical in style, oozing Corinthian columns and impressive pediments. With its public buildings, Liverpool was consciously creating a sort of forum for itself connecting itself in a way to ancient Rome, making itself into a capital city. So, with all of this commercial wealth and civic splendour and ambition, was Liverpool the capital of the North? I don't think so. I have a book. I often have a book. Got to get my ideas from somewhere. It's called The North of England, A History from Roman Times to the Present by Frank Musgrove. And in it he writes, the 19th century was a triumphant age for the North of England. And its greatest triumph was Manchester, shock city of the 1840s, international symbol of the new industrial age. When I go to Manchester from Newcastle, 
This is a terrible thing to say. I hope I don't get lynched in the northeast for saying this. I always feel as if I've arrived in the big city. The scale of everything is different. The streets are bigger and the buildings are bigger and the city centre is bigger too. I don't think Manchester's got as many historic buildings of superlative quality as Liverpool. It's not planned and it lacks the steep hills that make Newcastle such a wonderfully varied experience. It certainly doesn't have the range of ancient buildings to be found in York, but it's big. It's Victorian buildings are superb. I've been standing for ages now outside one of the best of them, Manchester Town Hall, the greatest town hall in the country, bar none. A wonderful, wonderful, extravagant, gothic masterpiece by the great Victorian architect, Alfred Waterhouse. Who is that on the roof? Manchester, as I've just said, is one of the places to come and see Victorian architecture at its most confident best. This one is the John Rylands Library in Deansgate, which is another fascinating piece of Victorian Gothic architecture. Whenever I come to Manchester, which I do quite often to see my sister-in-law, or Auntie Sheila as we call her, I look for excuses to get into as many buildings as possible. And I'm going to use this programme as a cunning wheeze to get inside here, which has been closed for some time for refurbishment and is not yet available to the public, though I believe it's going to open again in a few weeks' time. Oh, that's gorgeous. Do you know, I saw a picture of this place in one of my books ages ago and I've wanted to see it in the flesh, in the stone, as you might say, ever since. It's got a hint of Harry Potter about it, or the Lord of the Rings even. It's an accurate copy of the Middle Ages, but exaggerated, personalised, romanticised. It seems daft to be representing something as huge as Victorian Manchester by just one building, but this one is so typically Manchester. It was paid for by cotton, first of all. John Rylands was a hugely successful cotton manufacturer. Like many of his contemporaries, he was also a hugely charitable and religious man. So when he died, his wife, Enriqueta, built this place in his memory and she filled it with a remarkable collection of books and manuscripts. It belongs to the University of Manchester now, but it's also available to the public as a visitor attraction. So when it opens in a few weeks' time, get yourself down here because it's well worth a visit. Another thing that makes it typical of Manchester is that the architect was a man called Basil Champneys, who was one of the most advanced in Britain, and this building shows it. It's incredibly original in design and structure. It was built in the 1890s, for example, but it's got a concrete roof. A concrete roof on a room that looks like a medieval cathedral. A few years before this room was built, in 1881, a contributor to the Cornhill magazine, which is a major serious journal in the Victorian times, wrote this. He said, London is now isolated in the midst of the agricultural south. If Britain had now, for the first time, to choose a capital, its choice would naturally fall upon Manchester. It's a big claim. But then Manchester was a big place and it remains so. One of the exciting things that I found about Manchester is that the sort of adventure that it showed in a building like this in the 1890s, it's still showing today. Because if you want to be the capital of somewhere, especially somewhere as superb as the north of England, you've got to be bold and you've got to stay ahead of the game or somebody will snaffle your crown. 
come home. Come back to Tyneside. The Sage Music Centre in Gateshead by the River Tyne. Isn't that a terrific sight? Another place where the north is changing, keeping up with the times. And speaking of up and time, it nearly is. Time's nearly up for this series. We've had nine programmes, been to about 9,000 wonderful places, which have only had one thing in common. They're all in the north. No wonder I feel proud to live here.